In this conversation, I talk with my friend Gordon Brander. I met Gordon through Twitter and learning about his website, which is this delightful collection of different ideas and notes that he's taken over the years that's uh, presented in a way that helps him and others see the connections between these different patterns. And so we started by talking about that project and his website and what he's learned from doing that over the years. And then we branch out into a lot of different topics that I was just curious to get his perspective on. Uh, we talk about the web and the health of the web and different technological trends. We talk about the current project that he's working on around note-taking and kind of a new spin on how to use your notes for creativity. And then we also talk in the end about the environmental crisis and what he's seeing in that area as well. So it was a really delightful conversation on a lot of different topics. I think Gordon has fascinating perspectives on a lot of different issues. So I was delighted to talk to him and I hope you'll enjoy listening to it as well. Hi, Gordon. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So we met up a few years ago now, and I remember that uh, I had come across your Twitter and also through that, your website. And I was just immediately really drawn to your website and what you're trying to do there and felt sort of a kinship to it. And, you know, you, for those of people that don't know, you built your own tool to make your website that represents ideas in a certain way. And uh, that's what we ended up talking about in our first conversation a lot and like what that project was all about for you and what you're hoping to do with it. And I would love to sort of just like rehash that same conversation and hear from you like how, how you um, built that website and you know why you built your own tool and what you were trying to accomplish and maybe even how that's changed over time, maybe since we had that conversation a few years ago and just hear about what you're trying to do with your website as a sort of starting point for our conversation. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I mean, maybe to give a little bit of context, I have this website, it's gordonbrander.com. Um, most of it is devoted to this section that I call patterns, which are just like really loosely connected notes. I think of them almost as like digital index cards. Um, they're not very produced. They're actually mostly from a much larger set of notes that I've been developing for almost 10 years now. Um, and I clean them up a little bit and I, I throw them up on the website. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess the site grew out of this, um, this note-taking practice. So I'm um, uh, two things about me, I guess. One is uh, I have no formal education. Um, and I kind of finagled my way into tech after the dot-com crash. Um, so, uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm, I'm like a little bit ADD, I think, um, like have a hard time staying on track. And so this note-taking process was like this kind of evolutionary, um, hack, I guess, like a thing that I developed, uh, to kind of work around these limitations, um, that I, that I have, uh, in my personality. Um, and, and then it kind of built a momentum of its own. So I think when we met, that was maybe 2018, something mm -hmm. like that. that. Sounds about right. Yep. Um, yeah, I had been thinking for some years that I ought to take this, this set of notes, which had grown to something like 10,000 separate notes at that point and, and do something with it. Um, and the first thought that I'd had was to, you know, put up a blog and, um, but after sort of thinking about it for a while, I, I kind of was looking at blogs and I uh, doing a kind of design analysis. And I was like, hey, you know, blogs, they have this chronological assumption, um, right? That the content is kind of like newer content is privileged over older content. Um, and I felt like this created a sort of infinite treadmill where you'd be adding content and it would become less valuable over time. So you have to keep kind of churning new content into, into the mill. And I wanted to think through like what it might look like to take this interconnected set of notes um, and, and create a system where the things I added were a little more durable um, and, and also where each additional note that I add, each little bit of information that I add to the pile sort of increases the total value of the system. Um, so, and, and, you know, I had played around a lot with wiki software in the past, um, read a lot of kind of Doug Engelbart stuff, Ted Nelson Xanadu stuff, um, Ward Cunningham's experiments in the early days with the first wikis. And so like this, this kind of concept of hypertext was something that was deeply embedded within my 
um, within my mind. And I also love the idea of trying to find a way to have the information tell a story about itself. Um, so anyway, all that to say is I, I was playing around with what I could do within the limits of a static site um, system. This is where you basically have some files and then you have like a small computer program that turns those files into a website. And this is kind of a very like one shot thing. There's no sort of dynamic features to it. So it's, it's limiting, but it's also a lot easier to build something along those lines. Hmm. Um, and this was a nights and weekends project for me. So I had to kind of scope it down. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I tried a handful of different things that were available at the time, like Jekyll um, or uh, like Metalsmith was another at the time. These were all kind of um, different ways of taking files and turning them into web pages. Um, but none of them could really do uh, a, a particular thing that I was looking for, which was um, to gather all of the links between different pieces of content together and then let me do some kind of analysis over that in order to surface what's connected to what, which things have the most kind of inbound links. Um, so yeah, I ended up writing this little piece of software called Lettersmith. It's still up on GitHub. I know a handful of people use it to publish notes from Obsidian. Mm, fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I thought this was really cool. Just by totally by chance, because I built this years ago, mm -hmm. the mental model of Lettersmith um, and how I think about the content in that system is, is quite similar to Obsidian. And mm. um, the other thing about Lettersmith is that it's very easy to customize. So mm. I had gotten a little bit frustrated with a lot of these, um, the other tools, which kind of had what I felt like were pretty Baroque solutions. And I was kind of looking at this as I have some files. I want to transform them into some other kinds of files. That sounds kind of like a function in programming, which is just sort of like you put something in, you get something out. Really simple mm -hmm. model. And, um, and so Lettersmith actually is basically just one giant function that you compose from many smaller functions. And um, the tool itself is really just a library of functions that you can kind of glue together like Legos mm -hmm. um, to accomplish whatever you want. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that. Uh, that ends ended up being kind of like a, a thing that paid dividends in a way I didn't expect. And, and I'm pretty um, happy to see this little hobby project being used by Obsidian folks. It's neat. Mm, that's fascinating. So tell me about um, the kinds of things that you found yourself sharing notes about on your site and also maybe any themes or discoveries that you've had from, you know, empowering yourself with this sort of tool on top of, the notes that you've taken, like anything that you've discovered in the process of applying this tool to your notes? Yeah, I guess one, I mentioned the sort of ADD thing earlier. Um, one way this manifests is that my brain buffer is really small. Like the amount of stuff I can hold in my head at once is very small. Mm -hmm. So the way the practice started was just, I, I would capture everything um, as I was working on, on paper, or in text files. Um, so I, I have this folder that's just years worth of most, a lot of it's garbage, right? Um, and that's okay. Um, but I did start noticing after a while, just capturing everything that I got this kind of emergent set of themes. So I kept capturing, um, well, I, I guess actually the big three from the original wiki were people, projects, and patterns. Mm. Um, and, and I didn't know this at the time, but mm. it ended up being, um, very much in that vein. Uh, I'd say I'm, I'm too lazy to actually track, you know, sort of people in a CRM like way, but I probably should be doing that. Um, the things I end up mostly collecting are patterns and projects. So projects are often things like books and tools, resources, um, just stuff that's out there that I might find useful for reference at some later date. Um, mm -hmm. It might be like snippets, quotes from, you know, a book that I read um, or a website that I might return to later. Um, patterns are kind of reusable bits of knowledge. Um, they're really bite-sized. Uh, I usually only write like a paragraph's worth of content on, on a pattern. Um, and they aren't very formal. Like I think of a pattern as halfway between folklore 
and formalism. Um, so it's not science. Uh, it tends to be a little bit context specific, but somewhat generalizable. And the idea actually came from an architect, Christopher Alexander, who wrote a very famous book called A Pattern Language. Mm -hmm. And he, he had this kind of, um, I guess, ideological agenda for the practice of architecture. He felt like architects were designing buildings based on theory, based on ideas, and that um, the world is much too complex for the kinds of simple model, mental models that we can represent in our ideas. And that what we should really be doing is looking at healthy cities, um, ancient, ancient cities and recording the, the patterns that survived years of evolutionary selection. And so a pattern language is sort of a collection of those patterns that he and a team of other people identified in across many different cities so that you can kind of replicate those patterns in your own building practice. And um, the book itself is sort of a little paragraph sized chunks with um, reference numbers, little reference numbers that connect each pattern to other patterns in the book. And together they make a language. Um, he didn't have the benefit of hypertext at the time. This was written in, I think the seventies. Um, but today these are, these are things that we can build pretty organically and easily um, by leaning on the computer to help us um, maintain that network of connections between ideas. Mm -hmm. mm. Fascinating. So um, you found that there was like people, projects, and these patterns. And then within these patterns, um, you know, I know you've talked a lot about like design, and it seems like you have, and we talked about this previous as well, like interest in the environment and like software and maybe like. Um, and like things like project management and knowledge and things like this. What what um, what have you learned from seeing these patterns emerge and you know from articulating them over the years in your website? Yeah, I think I follow interests by gut a mm -hmm. lot, mm -hmm. and so one of the interesting things has been um, by cataloging the links between these ideas. Um, I actually see themes emerge. So it's reflected back to me uh, what my interests are and what the theme is through them because it's not actually clear to me often. Mm -hmm. And so I think I can step back, you know, so I've got, I'm just looking at my website right now, um, mm -hmm. gordonbrander.com pattern. And I've got a section here called Well Connected. And this mm -hmm. basically just tallies uh, the links to a specific note um, mm -hmm. and then ranks the notes by how many links. Um, so this is actually like a really um, low tech version of Google Pay PageRank. Um, mm -hmm. so this is how PageRank works. Is like it, they look at how many people are linking to a page, and then they score the pages based on on the number of links because that that inbound link is kind of a signal for something valuable is there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's funny. It's like the first one is a very meta topic, which is just design patterns themselves. I got storytelling, evolution, provoking emergence, uh, another story thing, something about fundamental needs, which is sort of my catch-all term for, you know, food, water, shelter, security, education, like all the basic kind of things that we need to satisfy uh, learning. So, I mean, the through line here for all of these is, is systems. I think um, maybe a lot of this is influenced by the fact that I kind of got uh, – I think uh, burnt somewhat early in my career um, and, uh, and wanted to understand what makes things, what makes some good ideas work and other good ideas not work. Mm -hmm. um, so I went through a phase where I was like, well, maybe it's about pitching those ideas better. So that's, you know, that's probably the storytelling bucket. Mm -hmm. It was like some set of years worth of learning how to tell a story about a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was like, okay, so I learned what I learned was like, that's, you know, maybe necessary, but not sufficient. And then it's, you know, so we've got another bucket here around like emergence and evolution. I would say that this is kind of like a current area of inquiry for me. It's like alive. It's a very alive topic for me right now. Um, and fundamental needs. This is, I guess, maybe the arc toward which everything else travels back. I, I this is what I care about most. I feel like, um, I don't know, from my privileged position, I would hope to be able to do a little bit of good in the world. And that means understanding what doing good means. Um, and I, it's it's hard to know that, like it's hard to answer that question. That's a 
it's a moral question, right? An ethical mm -hmm. question. Um, but I think one way to go to ground on that question is to understand the needs that we all have in common and try to serve those needs. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, it might be useful to circle back to what you said about, you know, being burned early in your career. And I, I think you've had a fascinating career and I would love to hear more about the trajectory that you've had so far. And that can, I think, kind of scaffold future lines of, for this conversation, just to tell, tell us how you, you know, you know, you, you said you didn't have a formal education, worked at Google, doing your own thing now. What, what's, what's uh, been the different projects that you worked on and how you came to do all that and so on? Yeah, I guess there's always risk in like over narrativizing career trajectories. So much of it sure. is luck and timing, but um, I will say, you know, I spent a gap year overseas before I really got into my career and it was very influential for me. Um, and uh, when I came into the workforce, I, I wanted to do something that involved tech because in high school I had taught myself to code. So I, I guess maybe some other context here is I'm like the child of two hippie parents, one of whom used to be a teacher. So I was homeschooled. So mm. like, yeah. I'm very much not a product of formal education for better or worse. Better. Uh, sometimes for worse. I, sometimes I think worse. I, I, I respect the sort of unschooling movements, you know, mm -hmm. kind of um, hobby horses. But I would also say as a product of that, there are there are downsides too. You know, there are many paths that you can take in life and they all come with trade-offs. <laughs> yeah, to be clear, I'm just saying better because I admire your website and your work so much. So it's like better for me at least that you have you well, know, your, your, your bent on things. So I, I like it, but uh, that's obviously just my limited perspective on your life, so. Sure. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I was landing in my early career um, just after the dot com bubble had caved. Mm. I guess it's 2006 or 2007, right around when the first iPhone comes out, if you can contextualize that. Um, mm -hmm. So, this is back when we were all kind of like on laptops with Napster and the internet was kind of a thing, but not really. And mobile phones were not really a thing. Mm. And I had actually come from this context overseas in Nepal, working in Nepal um, in this gap year thing where I noticed like um, everyone had a mobile phone, like a, like a feature phone, right? And um, at the time, I don't know if you remember the OLPC program. I do, yeah. One laptop. Yeah, this, yeah. this is very old history, yeah. But there's this notion that they could engineer a very durable, very cheap laptop and just get it out to everyone. And, and the idea was like that this would, you know, cause a flourishing of access to information and self-education. It was, it was all very idealistic. Mm -hmm. um, admirable ideals, maybe not so much in deployment. It didn't quite ever land. Mm -hmm. And I was noticing like, nobody's buying an OLPC, but everyone, no matter how much money they make is buying a mobile phone. So what's going on mm -hmm. here? So I had sort of decided I wanted to do something in mobile. Um, and I kind of finagled my way into a production studio. So like talent was scarce. It was just after the crash. I was like a young kid. And I, I, I built up a portfolio just doing sort of like cranking out um, websites and that sort of thing. And ended up landing at Mozilla. Hmm. Um, so Mozilla is a, is a browser company. It's the company that makes Firefox. And mm -hmm. an interesting thing about Mozilla is that they're a nonprofit um, and they're very ideological <laughs> like one of the early <laughs> mozilla logos is totally a communist star like mm -hmm. a soviet you know, um which can maybe gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of the vibe there it's very early internet you know sort of um anarchist kind of vibes and um and a lot of people of goodwill who want to do some good in the world there uh so that really infected me at a, at a pretty young age, like early 20s. And I spent, um, you know, let's see, I spent five years, I guess, working on three different browsers and an operating system there. So the first project I worked on was a, was a brand new browser for this new thing called the iPad. And I, I had the good luck of being able to kind of like rethink what that meant for that form factor and the answer I came up with was something kind of like um, uh, Pinterest I guess hmm. 
like a like a, it was too early but my basic idea was like okay this is like a lean back experience you want to kind of like cruise through the web collect things so it didn't quite look like a browser it didn't quite land interesting ideas in there i guess um the second thing i worked on was uh and this was maybe two three years after the iphone was this uh project called firefox os um and firefox os was interesting so this is like for context, iPhone had basically gained some traction in the market. Android had not yet taken off, but was just starting to. And um, the thought at the time was that there was an opportunity for like a third way, because mm -hmm. there were a lot of disgruntled <laughs> cellular companies <laughs> who didn't like the iPhone. And, um, and we were like, well, we care about the web. If we get in there with an operating system that's web all the way down, we can kind of like jump to this next paradigm. Hmm. and and get it everywhere so this is all you know idealistic young gordon was like yeah this is great let's do this um when i <laughs> when i said like i had some career traumas i think this is one of them it was like a really good lesson in how a nice idea like something that's nice in in theory can really just like fail hard in the market uh due to forces that you might not have considered um hmm. so in in the case of Firefox OS, you know, we really poured our heart and soul into the design of the thing. Um, and I even think a lot of the market sort of framing was correct. They targeted low end phones in in markets outside the US. So they're like, we're not going to compete directly with the iPhone or with Android. We're going to go elsewhere. Um, but uh, the 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 thing that ended up mattering was the ecosystem. It was the apps. It was like the App Store, which was kind of still pretty new. But the networks were effects around that were a big, big deal. Um, so I ended up kind of trying to give my, myself a little bit of an MBA in a in a like in a couple of years through like reading blogs and books and stuff and and trying to understand these market forces. Um, I actually that that's another thing that we connected over in San Francisco, if I remember right, is Wardley mapping. Um, so mm -hmm, that that's right. Interesting was yeah it was the experience of being burned by the market and and being like wait a minute there are these other forces it sometimes you can build the right thing you can build it beautifully it can be good and you can still fail because there's these exogenous not really exogenous like forces um that you you, you know you need to be aware of um so yeah, so yeah I, I don't know um so that was that was uh mozilla I had a little side quest over at MIT working on open source um, software for farming. And then, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And, and before that, actually, I worked on um, Servo, uh, on the front end of Servo, which was Mozilla's experimental rendering engine. Um, so uh, I, I guess, you know, um, to sum it up, so let's see. Uh, iPad OS browser, Firefox OS, a servo browser. Um, then I made the jump to Google and was working. I, I owned a VR browser there for the time that Google was invested in VR um, and then was over at Chrome. Um, but the basic theme through all of this stuff is like, I, I care about the web. I was burned by the jump to mobile. I could see it was going to be a big deal, but it was just like, very much Clayton Christensen innovator's dilemma. You're caught up in the incentives of the existing system. You can't make the evolutionary jump. And so you just watch yourself kind of like die in slow motion. And mm -hmm. so uh, I guess up till this point, my career has been trying to find uh, a way to help the web make the next evolutionary jump um, before it comes. Uh, because with mobile, the web initially didn't make the jump and then sort of jumped in late after the train had left the station and spent 10 years making the web do apps and is only now getting at the starting line mm -hmm. for that problem. Um, and I, I personally, I, I feel the web is really important. Um, a friend of mine, Dave Herman, who um, is like a web standards person, he says, the reason I care about the web is because it's the world's biggest software platform that isn't owned. Hmm. Um, and, and I feel the same way, like networked computing mediates a lot of our life. 
um, increasingly more and more of our life. And I think it's really important that we have some collectively owned, like collaboratively owned systems, open systems for network computing. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think the web can survive too many more uh, sort of missed trains. Mm. So, you know, my work on VR was sort of one attempt. It turned out to be too early. Um, and in, in a weird way, the, my new project is sort of uh, pulling on this thread as well. Right. Yeah. And I don't, I do want to ask you that, but I, I'd like to pull back to talking about Servo for a second, because this is something mm -hmm. that we reconnected about recently. Um, you know, we were talking about the launch of Mighty and you had a sort of thread about that uh, browser and, um, uh, you know, tell me, tell me what you're seeing there, both in the context of the work that you did on Servo and uh, where that stands now and then what kind of patterns you're seeing in the web currently, you know, around things like Mighty, but not necessarily restricted to that. Yeah, I think the right way to understand Servo is as a kind of ambitious moonshot project. It doesn't <laughs> seem like building a new browser engine should be that big of a deal, but um, the thing about the web is it's an evolutionary system. So it started out very, very simple. Um, it used to be the easiest thing in the world to build a browser deliberately, like Tim Berners-Lee developed HTML in such a way early on that it had very few features and you could build many different kinds of browsers. So they had like terminal-based browsers, voice-based browsers, um, visual browsers at the beginning. And um, as it grew, as the web grew, um, he had designed it in such a way that it was evolvable, extendable. and uh, the thing about evolutionary systems is they get weird really fast. Like if you mm. think about like the Amazon rainforest and all the interconnections between species and how if you like remove this one species from the ecosystem, the whole thing just collapses. Um, all ecosystems are like this, actually. All evolved ecosystems are like this, including the web. And um, yeah, so we have this big mass of evolved features and every contemporary browser, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, is a fork of some older browser that can trace its lineage back through history. So it's almost like you can rewind time by digging through the code base. So building a new browser actually is sort of like trying to re-engineer the, the Amazon rainforest from scratch. It's, it's very daunting. Um, and there are parts of the web that are actually kind of un unimplementable. So what Servo was trying to do was build a, a rendering engine for a browser. And that, that's the bit that basically takes the code and turns it into pixels, like draws the web page. And they're trying to build one along a totally reimagined architecture. So the, the architecture that all the browsers have today was originally designed to render sort of text documents. And then we've, we've made it do a lot of other things, including like I'm streaming video right now and talking with you through a browser. It's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. um, and it does all those things, but it might not necessarily do them well all the time. There are performance issues. There are you know, historical oddities for compatibility reasons that cannot be removed, but have serious performance implications. And wh what this means, uh, at, at root, one of the things that this means is that the web is generally um, engineered with the assumption of a single core CPU. So this mm -hmm. means like, you know, one brain that sort of chews through the problem of rendering the web page, spits it out. Newer machines actually have many cores. So they have many little brains that can do a lot of different tasks at once. So ideally, what you actually want to do is split problems up, share them out between all those little brains, and then sew up the result and hand it over. That's a lot faster and, and a lot of programs this way, but the web can't. Um, so Servo, Servo basically uh, found a way to make this work. And the crazy thing was, it's such a difficult problem to do correctly that they actually needed to first invent a brand new um, programming language to be even be able to express these relationships correctly. And that, that language is called Rust. So uh, this is actually becoming pretty popular today. Um, it was originally designed in order to be able to create Servo. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Servo and Rust, they kind of co-evolved. And um, Servo itself, I, I ended up coming into Mozilla Research to help build a, a UI for it, like to sort of wrap it in a browser so that you could actually use it. And an experimental browser, but it was, it was pretty cool. 
we're doing a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of really interesting things about this, uh, this software. Like it had a totally different set of assumptions at the architectural level about how the web works. And often, you know, a challenge on web pages is getting like smooth animations rendering at 60 frames a second, which is sort of fast enough for the human eye to perceive smooth continuous movement. And if you if you miss that frame rate, you end up with like really janky feeling, gross feeling animations. So um, typically the problem is not enough frames on the web. On Servo, <laughs> we once I remember ran into this problem where uh, it was producing too many animation frames. It was like a Whoa. thousand frames a second or something like that, Whoa. like rendering them buttery smooth, but like just causing the laptop to you know the fans to spin up and stuff. Somebody had forgotten to throttle it, like to basically uh -huh. put an up limit on the number of frames that it wow. would give you. Wow, it was pretty. Funny. Um, and you could do a lot of other interesting things too. Like today on the web, you want to be very careful about how and when you touch the DOM, which is sort of the underlying code of the web page, because you can cause performance issues. And on um, on Servo, you could just kind of freely bash the DOM, just like write to it continually, not a problem. Hmm. Um, so it was it was pretty cool. Like we were building with it, and we we're like, this feels native because it's so it's so like smooth. What if we actually built the browser in HTML? <laughs> so, which well, was kind of an interesting adventure. So we ended up building something kind of like. Electron. I don't know. If, uh, so Electron, yeah, it's like basically a little thing you can use to make an app out of a web page. So we started there. We built something like that for Surfo. So you could kind of just create a rectangle on the screen. And within that rectangle, it would draw a web page. And so the browser itself was a web page. And then inside of that web page would be another web page, which was the, the actual web page that you, the user, were using. Whoa. And we were like, this is going to be all kinds of interesting because we can do things like delivering the UI of the browser over over the wire, like over HTTP, just like you do a web page. So it could update itself really rapidly. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think the challenge with Servo um, is that, uh, <laughs> and we we always knew this would be the challenge, but you can get to the eighty percent mark really quickly of re-implementing the web. But then there's this long tail of like really brutal compatibility issues. This it actually in most cases looks like re-implementing the bugs uh, of the web, like the mistakes of the web, because it turns out that those mistakes have become load bearing. And this is like another feature of evolutionary systems. Like many things that look wrong actually end up becoming part of the design that has evolved. So you can't just remove them. Um, so this was like, uh, I, I feel like Servo was sort of asymptotically approaching something that was shippable to consumers. And, and there was a lot of like leadership sort of upset and Servo was the pet project of a particular leader who ended up getting bounced out of the company. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what actually ended up happening in the end is that it, it got stripped for parts and integrated into Firefox. And, mm. and my feeling personally is that it has marginally improved Firefox. Um, but the thing about Servo is that it was a step change game. It wasn't like, oh, it's 5% faster. You know, it was it was like a completely different kind of thing. And um, mm -hmm. sometimes I, I long for a universe where, <laughs> where, where we made it across the finish line. It would have been really something to see. Mm -hmm. So um, Rust was a huge success, maybe unexpected, who knows. Right. Um, Servo was, parts of it were integrated into Firefox and Firefox is marginally better. And then Servo itself, its original vision is like dead in the water, never to return. I guess it depends on who you ask. So it's open source, um, mm -hmm. which means that there's no way to really kill it. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the resourcing that Mozilla was pouring into it is has gone on now mm -hmm. to other companies. Like a lot of those people have moved on. Um, so my my read is um, probably it's not you know where the breakthrough is going to come from. Even though I, I feel like uh, <laughs> it's like that bit in Star Wars, like you were the chosen one, you know, <laughs> like it <laughs> yeah, I don't feel it. Yeah, and so but it's this not, is not called... actively being developed or not really put any support behind any by from any like particular company or project or anything. 
I think that's right. I don't want to state it too strongly because I haven't actually checked in to see who's still working on it, but I know that some of the core folks have moved on. Um, maybe there is actually enough accrued value there that some smart person could take it and, and do something with it. Um, mm -hmm. This has happened before. It actually, that's how Safari and then later Chrome came about is um, somebody took what was essentially abandoned software and built it up. So never mm -hmm. say never. Um, I, I, I do think that it represents a sort of a path evolution could have taken and didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't see that as a failure. Like history is full of contingencies. Like we, I think easily could have lived in a world where most of our software was written in Lisp or most of our software was written in Smalltalk or Ted Nelson had like nailed the landing with Xanadu and, and or whatever these other sort of historical turning points that software nerds like to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, often it comes down to some choice that somebody makes in a boardroom because of a business decision that's very short term. Uh, you never know, right? And, and so I, I think it's no reflection on Servo that it didn't quite mm -hmm. pan out the way we'd hoped. Um, Sounds like it was kind of a political <laughs> shift that caused it to... Uh, uh, that's my read. Um, I admittedly it was gone at, from Mozilla by the time it happened. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was at Chrome at the time. I see. Um, but it does seem that way. Uh, you asked about Mighty. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Did Tell I me what you think that? about where things are. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, both, both, both what you think about that particular product, but also just given what we just shared and what you've seen over the years, what you yeah. see coming down the line for computing and the internet and so on. Yeah, I want to avoid making a value judgment. Mm -hmm. mm. I want to make a value judgment and then bracket it. <laughs> so, okay, great. I love it. Because I often think like uh, we want to reflect our values through technology, but often it is these exogenous forces that end up swaying things one way or the other. So we have to learn to work with them. Um, I'll, I'll say a couple things I think are really important about the web, uh, at least as it was initially conceived. Um, one is that in the original web, um, the system was supposed to be open and decentralized. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that it's lived up to those goals somewhat and failed on them somewhat. It is still collaboratively owned. Like anyone can participate um, in the standardization process. It's not easy, but it's like a thing that can be done. Um, I, the other thing about the, the web is that um, it is like the, the notion of a browser <laughs> at browser companies, we call them user agents. And this is maybe a little bit of a rosy view in 2021, but like the initial idea was that this was a thing that existed on behalf of the user, you, not on behalf of some company. So unlike an app where like the company gives you a thing and then the company controls the experience you're getting, the original notion of the, the web was that there's this kind of decoupling between the content that a company is delivering to you and the way that it's interpreted. Hmm. Um, and so over the years, that's allowed for things to emerge like ad blocking, like it's possible to separate the ads from the content, um, things like screen readers. So the web is very, very good for accessibility, like people who are differently abled and have a, a bunch of different needs. Um, the web can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. It can be read. Um, it can, like the way that it's rendered can be changed. So if you have a different, like, um, uh, like color blindness or something like that, or you need larger contrast, bigger fonts, like these things can all be done on the web because it's not just delivering pixels to you. Like it's not just delivering an image. It's delivering pretty um, well annotated code that the browser then interprets. So like that, that seems pretty important. Um, I do think in 2021, uh, through all of this evolutionary accrual, the web is maybe not living up to all of those ideals as well as it should be. Hmm. And, and additionally, we have a, a handful of secular trends, like sort of driving forces of change that I think are maybe nudging the equilibrium of the future of the web one way or another. Um, so one of them is, uh, well, I guess the, the motivating issue here is that the web is, is just kind of a challenge to build for. Um, it's slower than it should be. And uh, 
Um, it's also, I, I would say it's, it's open, um, but it's also, it's consolidated quite a bit. So there's, you know, a handful of big players. Most people go to most of the same big websites all the time. And that just means that power has accumulated, you know, around these sort of power centers. Mm -hmm. um, so Mighty, to track back to Mighty, um, <laughs> that was a lot of bracketing, I'm sorry. Uh, the idea of Mighty is, is, as I understand it, is that instead of just like rendering, so taking the code and interpreting it and drawing a picture on your computer, which is what all browsers do today, Mighty has a headless version of Chrome in the cloud. So they have like a big powerful computer. They're taking the website code, they're rendering an image, and then they're actually streaming video of the website down to you. Mm -hmm. And um, this is kind of interesting. So this actually has been done before. There was an old browser called Opera Mobile before the iPhone that did this for mobile phones. And at the mm -hmm. time, there was a lot of hue and cry from like the EFF and people like that, because what that, <laughs> what that actually does is it puts whoever is doing the streaming in the middle of all of your web browsing. So essentially, you better hope that you trust that company because they can see everything. Um, and uh, it also means that they, they mediate um, what you're seeing in a way that is it's not the same. So, so like Opera, for example, in back in the day would actually overlay ads on top of the web page, um, and that's one way they mm -hmm. they funded this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that Mighty maybe they'll I, who knows like who knows what they're going to do there. But it is fundamentally um, <laughs> one way that to can, like to see it is as a sort of man in the middle attack if you're being uncharitable. Another way to see it is maybe uh, as like a VPN. Like if their incentives are aligned, they could. Um, mask who you are to the websites that you visit, but but they're going to know all the websites you visit. So that's it's kind of interesting because I think just like setting aside all value judgment, they're leaning into a, a driving force of change right now, which is that like cloud computing is really cheap, um, and so uh, in in a lot of business ways, it makes sense to offload a ton of code to the cloud, and and have your client like your phone or your laptop you just sort of like a window into some other computer out there um and they can scale it up or down as they need um i think there's kind of like another driving force that i've been tracking for quite some time um which is uh this technology called WebAssembly, and WebAssembly is basically um a very low level new kind of code that you can run in the browser. It's very fast. It's like native fast. And you can combine it with another technology called WebGL, which just lets you draw to the screen. And between the two of them, what you end up getting is something that's a very much like a native app, but it's securely sandboxed, uh, just like everything else in the browser. And that means you can deliver it over the internet without having to have an install step for security reasons. Um, so this is pretty cool. And there are people like Rick Arends on Twitter that have been actually building new ways to, to create apps um, from the ground up, where almost in concept, what you're doing is shipping like a mini browser into the browser. You're like, yeah. all the code that's needed to draw things, plus the app itself is all kind of coming down as, as a bundle. And the crazy thing is it performs really, really well. It's like natively fast. Um, so I kind of see these two things in tension. I'm, you know, on the one hand, there's Mighty and it's saying move everything to the cloud. On the other hand, there's WebAssembly and it's saying move everything to the client. Like we're just gonna sort of shift everything to the edge. Um, I don't know which of these is gonna win out as a paradigm. Uh, it may be both. I do think that both of them are indicative of kind of late stage diseases of old age in the web ecosystem. Like there are just a number of intractable problems. You'd hope for these things to be sort of solved at the platform level, um, but there are a number of problems that are just genuinely hard to solve at the platform level. And so in absence of like a solution from the browser, we're seeing sort of the power devolve to um, 
you know, companies uh, who are coming up with other solutions that are layered on top. Um, so I'm, I'm tracking it. I, I think, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm not particularly personally, personally very fond of Mighty's approach, but I also think that there's a lot going for it strategically. Um, it's also I, just it's impressive. It seems, it seems impressive to me anyway. Yeah, it's, um, I will say this, most of the heavy lifting engineering wise was done by Chrome, like making mm -hmm. it possible to run Chrome in a headless ma manner is a thing that's been, um, you know, that was done, I don't know, five years ago or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's also it enables things like Electron. Mm -hmm. uh, you can basically just unplug all of the engine from the car is, is kind of conceptually what's happening and then just run the engine in some other context. Um, I, I think, you know, it's not a surprise to me that VCs love it uh, because I think the end state, the winning sort of state for Mighty is that they become the pipe through which all the internet traffic flows. And at that point, you can sort of cut Facebook and Google off at the knees. Like hmm. you're controlling the pixels the user sees and, and so you win. Um, I, I, I can sort of imagine scenarios where this might be interesting, like an interesting future. Like if it looked more like a VPN that preserved your privacy and you have a relationship with a company that you're paying money to. And so, yeah, they know all your content, but their incentives are aligned in such a way that they're going to protect it. I kind of don't feel like that's what's going to happen <laughs> because advertising based models just outcompete every time. Um, mm. Unfortunately, uh, at the same time too, there's this other weird kind of dynamic with, um, with WASM, so WebAssembly, sorry, uh, this, this other approach where you move everything to the edge, uh, which is that if you write an app in this way, it's often possible actually to compile it to native in a cross-platform way. So you can hit iOS, Android, and the web with the same code uh, and, and desktop. And um, that's a really interesting value proposition for developers, especially because we sort of live in this deeply siloed world where you have to really hope that Apple doesn't ban your app. And it just, it, I, I, I don't know, as someone who's building an app now, I think I would feel pretty <laughs> encouraged to know that I could always route around it and be like, well, that's a bummer. I'm just going to go through the web, right? <laughs> um, so I, I do expect we're going to see a lot of movement around that as well. Um, and it's it's hard to say which of these futures you know will win out or whether we'll live between the sort of the weird turbulent zone of of the both of them. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. Um, let me ask you about a different angle on sort of the same question, which is you know when we when you and I were talking about Mighty before this, I was sort of lamenting to you that I loved a lot of the software that's being made out there, but I'm sort of um, yeah, lamenting the fact that so many of them are using subscription-based models, which obviously has advantages even for customers and that you can like sort of count on the software company being around more than you might have if it was like free or a one-time purchase or something like that. But on the other hand, there are so many pieces of, you know, really excellent software that are being developed. And like, it, at least for me with my budget, it's not feasible to buy all of the software that I might want to. And, and even more so, I've seen that with, you know, I've worked in multiple nonprofits now and nonprofits, even though a lot of the softwares will have, you know, discounted nonprofit pricing, not all of them. If you're running a software company, please have discounted nonprofit pricing. Uh, but, but even then with the discounts, so even a very generous discount, like there's just so many things that would be good to have that like, especially for small nonprofits, small businesses, you know, small groups of people, it's not feasible to have, you know, 10 different things that you're paying for on a subscription basis. So I think that that's not really a sustainable trend from what I can tell. Um, mm -hmm. At least it maybe maybe it's just like an awkward junction point where it's it's sort of suboptimal, at least for me and the, the groups that I'm in. But um, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about that and kind of uh, see what you see is happening there currently and where that might shift in the future. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would have to say I share your frustration with the cost of services um, in general. It just sort of reminds me of the the trend toward, you know, even without a sub servicing model, like a lot of, I think, 
uh, Americans live on sort of financing plans for various kinds of expensive product. And um, there's like a real interesting kind of like flow challenge of uh, most of most of I think the average person's income being saturated by recurring charges. Hmm. Um, I don't know what to say about it, but I can step back and kind of like maybe think about the dominant kinds of business model that exists right now and how they might change. So I, I guess the way I see it is there are three, maybe four um, big revenue models that exist right now. And I think that there are s- some new ones on the horizon that might upend the landscape. So um, the big one and probably the most dominant in terms of shaping culture are what um, analyst Ben Thompson would call an aggregator. So this is a company like Facebook or Netflix or Amazon. And their basic model is that they aggregate demand. Um, so in the case of Facebook or, or, or uh, yeah, let's, let's start with Facebook. Like Facebook's a, a great example of this. They basically aggregate eyeballs, like people like you and I, who want something to look at while we're standing in line. And then they leverage that demand to commodify supply. So supply in Facebook's case is like influencers, content creators, people who make videos. Um, That's a pretty rough position to be in if you're a content creator, because these these sites, they give you the reach, but then they make it really hard to actually kind of make a living off of Mm. um, off of that, because that you don't actually as a creator own a relationship with your customer, like Facebook owns that relationship and they rent it out to you. but because they just have such massive network effects, they're able to kind of like be this middleman and, and essentially extract that rent. Um, so that's aggregators. I think subscription services are kind of the other big one. Um, Netflix is both an aggregator and a subscription service. So it's a little fuzzy. A lot of aggregators are actually ad, ad-based. Um, Can you um, sort of uh, break down how net? It's obvious to me how Netflix is subscription-based, but can you kind of break down how it's an aggregator as well? Um, so my understanding, and, and I'm sort of recapitulating some Ben Thompson stuff, mm-hmm. so he's actually a source for this, mm-hmm. strategy.com, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so they own a very large subscription base, which gives them a lot of leverage to commodify supply of movies during the time when they negotiate, mm-hmm. um, or alternatively, like when hiring directors and that kind of thing. Um, for, for their original features. So they basically, it, it is kind of a strange aggregator model, even though it's subscription based because they're, they're still leveraging that, that network effect of all the people that go to Netflix. Um, but, uh, that subscription model, it it has become really popular. I, I don't know enough to get into this, but I do know that a recurring revenue model is generally a very good model. If you are a, um, if you're a business, when, when Adobe switched to the recurring revenue for Photoshop, <laughs> people were very unhappy, myself included, uh, mm-hmm. cause I can't afford that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but they make a lot more money now than they used to. And some amount of people are willing to pay it. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, with, with in-app subscriptions in the app stores, especially the, the cost to set up a subscription service has gone down. Mm-hmm. And so we've seen more of them. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's, uh, still out there, some people who sell like software, um, one, you know, you give me money, I give you software, Mm -hmm. um, which is a nice, honest way to make a living. And it's just tricky though, because the, uh, it goes against the grain of the medium, like software is free to copy. And, and it's basically zero marginal cost to add an additional user. Mm-hmm. And so like, the odds are really in favor of like these sort of um, either Facebook or subscription models, because um, if I make a service that's free and I monetize via advertising, that lowers the friction significantly to get you to join. Mm-hmm. And like, it's like, okay, it's free. I go through a sign up form, whatever. Um, and, and so you can just really rapidly grow an audience this way because there's no friction involved. And then you have this network effect and then you can leverage it to commodify your suppliers, whoever they are. Mm-hmm. Um, same with subscriptions in a sense, it's like 
weirdly easier to sign up for, you know, the Disney plus five bucks a month, whatever, than it is to like fork over, uh, you know, 50 bucks or something um, for, for a triple A game. And, uh, and so I, I think, you know, there's a sense in which you're amortizing the cost there. You're kind of getting rid of the sticker shock. The, at the end of the day, the consumer probably ends up paying more, like the person mm -hmm. ends up paying more. Um, so I, I don't know, I, this is a dilemma for me because I, I, I aggregators especially bother me. Um, I think they're kind of an, an inevitable outcome of the way technology works today, um, but they have some really negative effects. I mean, I, we talk a lot, I think in, at this, time about like you know privacy sort of implications of companies like Facebook the political power that they wield all that kind of stuff um but just fundamentally too i think aggregators have to limit the creative uh potentiality of of their platforms so um there's this famous line that bill gates said when he was in a pitch meeting with Facebook at one point, talking about the Facebook platform this, the face, Facebook platform that. And he just sort of, he stood up and he's like, uh, let me see if I can remember this. Uh, that's a crock of shit. It isn't a platform. A platform is when the economic value of everybody that uses it exceeds the value of the company that creates it. Hmm. That's a platform. Um, and so, so I, I think that, you know, something like Facebook, it looks like a platform, but it's not. Like a platform is basically uh, something that solves a bunch of hard problems so that people can freely build on, on top something more interesting. So like something like an operating system or a browser is a platform. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about browsers and about operating systems is that the power actually devolves to the people building the content. Like I can sort of build whatever web page that I want and it doesn't matter what Firefox thinks or Chrome thinks, it's not up to them. Um, I can do whatever I want. Um, and, and likewise, at least with traditional operating systems, I can build an app. I can, actually the browser is the sort of a story, like it sort of disrupted the operating system, disrupted Windows in a big way, the web did. And, and Bill Gates hated it, but there was nothing he could do about it. Um, that is not true on Facebook. Like I, you can't build whatever you want on Facebook, even back when they had an app platform. And, and there is just this fundamental problem. Um, like you can build Facebook on top of the web. You cannot build a web on top of Facebook. Hmm. And, and, and actually I found like a really nice bit of cybernetics theory that kind of explains why this is the case, why this keeps hmm. emerging. Um, it's called uh, Ashby's law of requisite variety. Hmm. Um, the so basic idea is like whoever in a system has the most expressive variety gets to drive the plot hmm. of how the system evolves. Um, and you see this happen over and over in systems. So if you're Facebook and you give the power to, you know, to, to sort of do whatever you want, um, you're pretty quickly going to get someone within Facebook who creates uh, something that routes around Facebook, like creates a Facebook in a Facebook, right? <laughs> kind of like the browser created an OS in an OS. Mm -hmm. And, and the, they're gonna like steal the plot from you. And so you kind of have to clamp down. Same with app stores, actually. Um, app stores kind of have a lot of aggregation characteristics. Um, they're not pure aggregators, but I think they get there. So like it's illegal uh, or, or it's not allowed, I should say, on iOS to build an app store it, that competes with the app store. Like you can't, mm. you can't do that in the app store. Um, it's also actually um, not allowed to have an app that lets users write code. Mm. So um, like in the browser, you can, you can do this. Um, and it's one of the reasons that we have like such a vibrant web is you can kind of build whatever you want, ship whatever you want. Um, but they know that if they gave the ability to um, ship code uh, over the wire and sort of install it, you know, uh, within within an app. That this would basically open up like a, a space for someone to come in and kind of steal the plot from from iOS, like steal the the um, the power away from them. Um, 
so in a lot of ways, these these platforms have gotten smart, um, and and they've kind of locked things down just enough that they have some generative potential and they can skim the cream off the top. Um, I, I think this is unfortunate. I think it's another reason we need to hopefully save the web and, and, and also create more things like the web whenever we have the opportunity. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, yeah, let's circle back to what you're doing now and the, you know, you're working on some kind of notes app, yes? Yeah. Um, so tell me about that. Believe it or not, this all folds in. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, I've been working on this sort of giant pile of notes, something like 20,000 notes now, I think, mm -hmm. for 10 years. And um, I've kind of been satisficing with tools uh, that were not great, but good enough for some years. And um, you know, Lettersmith, the uh, the static site generator that we talked about earlier that I built was kind of my first nights and weekends attempt to build a tool for myself that would do something more interesting than just like a basic notebook app. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I'll, around the same time too, we had a bunch of new things to bring up like Rome, Obsidian. I remember chit chatting with Connor early on and it was pretty cool. Like we had a lot of convergent evolution. We'd been thinking along similar lines for some years. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, like I've wanted something that's a little different, like to to what's out there in the market now, and that's uh, less <laughs> less a tool for thought, and more what I've been thinking of is like tarot for thought, like a kind of creative partner um, that can help provoke ideas mm. using using kind of as as its memory the set of things that you've already written down. Um, now. I have a reason to believe that this is possible. One reason is that um, over the years, I've built a lot of like hacky little tools that kind of crawl through my notes and will do things like collide ideas together that look a little bit similar or generate like prompts. And, um, or even in one case, I had like a, a generative system that would take trends that I had been noting down and then spin up like potential futures by mashing those trends together. Just like really wild experiments like this. And I found them to be really generative. Um, and I've, I've often found that I'm like the lone creative, like the lone sort of designer on a team. And a, a, a challenge I think with a lot of creative work is you want, you want some dialogue between you and another creative partner. Mm -hmm. It helps you get out of your head. Um, it helps you get unstuck because they reflect back to you what you say from a different angle. It surprises you and you see things from a new perspective. It causes breakthroughs. Um, so I've had to sort of hack around not having that in a lot of my career. And um, I've, I've settled on using a lot of tools kind of in this genre. Like, uh, do you know Brian Eno's Oblique Strategies? Oh, I do, yeah. Uh, but explain in case someone doesn't. Okay, so I, I actually, I have a knockoff deck here. So this is, mm. these are they're just cards. Um, mm. Each one has a kind of like a cryptic phrase. And the goal is when you get stuck uh, on a creative problem, you're supposed to draw a card and then try to interpret it. So I'm going to draw a card here. So we got, here's our card. Oops. It says, destroy mm. nothing, the most important thing. Mm. So what does this mean? Mm. Like it doesn't actually mean anything by itself. It's, it's a provocation. It's, um, it's like a rich sort of symbol that is, is daring you to project meaning onto it. But the meaning is coming from you. It's basically mm -hmm. just a catalyst, right? It's, and, and, and so this is actually, this is a really powerful tool, I think, for creative work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, one of the things I try to encourage others to do, I do this, um, is uh, building your own deck of oblique mm -hmm. strategies, like try to try to come up with your own provocations. Um, and they can be, you know, these are very abstract. Listen to the quiet voice. It's another mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, but they can be really specific too. Like I found really cool decks uh, that people have made for themselves, other creatives who have kind of glommed onto this method that are things like writing prompts, you know, they might be like very specific to the kind of creative work that you do. Like 
a bunch of sci-fi plot ideas or something like that. Um, but what this tells me is like, you can build really simple systems that can provoke creativity. Hmm. And then in the case of oblique strategies, it's not very smart. It's just really carefully curated ingredients plus randomness. Mm -hmm. um, so we can do that. Uh, that's kind of interesting. But we can also start to do on a computer, if, if we're taking notes down, we can start to um, look at what's in the notes and analyze the structure, you know, uh, look at the links between the notes and, and start to do things that are even maybe a little bit smarter than that uh, without even having to do like fancy GPT-3, AI, whatever. Like it can just be like pretty simple and, and, and yet very generative. So the basic idea of this app is it's kind of a, a self-organizing notebook that gets more generative the more you add to it. And, and what it does is when you add things to it, the basic view of the app is not just a sort of a reverse chronological list of notes or something like that. It's, um, it's an algorithmically generated feed. It's generated locally on your phone. So it basically goes through your notes and it, it does things like resurface old notes, find notes that might be related and, and sort of like packages them together and you know puts them in front of you. Um, generates prompts. Uh, so there's actually maybe some commonalities here between what I'm doing and and spaced repetition apps like like Anki. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the difference is that Anki is trying to program uh, memorization, like convergence. It's got a specific timing around which these things are served to help uh, you converge on remembering. Uh, mm -hmm set of things. Uh, I'm kind of going in, in a very different direction, which is like the feedback loop I'm, I'm creating is really not about making you converge at all. It's about making you diverge, like to kind of see things from angles you never saw them before, um, to spin off in directions you never anticipated. And then when you have an idea because of one of these prompts, uh, it helps you jot it down on the spot. It captures the thing that, that sort of prompted you along with your notes. And then it dumps that now into the pot, the giant pile of notes. And so you end up with this kind of flywheel where it's like prompt that generates an idea, which then gets folded into the notes, which then generates more prompts, which generates more ideas, which generates mm -hmm. more prompts. Um, so I don't know, I, I'm, I'm experimenting with sort of different game mechanics now and kind of dialing it in, living with it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the basic idea. I'm, I'm calling it uh, subconscious because mm -hmm. I want it to be not so much a tool for thought as like a tool for creativity, like a second mm. subconscious. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah, <laughs> I think it'll be fun. Uh, I've certainly goofed around with enough kind of things in the periphery, like generative algorithmic systems, um, you know, things like oblique strategies. I think there are systems like, like tarot or the I Ching that I think have a very similar vibe and come from spiritual traditions. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not qualified to speak to those, but I, I think that, we actually have a pretty rich history of like generative, you know, systems that kind of mm -hmm. live in this creative space. And, and that's kind of what I'm after. It's maybe like a, a tool in that genre. Amazing. And, and so it's sort of like you have uh, some kind of prototype that just you're using currently. That's sort of the stage that it's at. I'm building it now. So mm -hmm. I'm starting with iOS and mm -hmm. um, uh, it's it's not quite in working order. Mm -hmm. I have built like prototypes that did test aspects of these mm -hmm. ideas, uh, but they were kind of throwaway prototypes. Like in the engineering world, we often, you know, sort of built one to throw away or build a, a works like or or a looks like prototype. So these are just mm -hmm. kind of like paper thin, like <laughs> like fakey fakey, but they kind of let you test out an aspect of the idea. Um, now I'm trying to build something a little more robust and mm -hmm. something to put into others' hands that they could live with. And mm -hmm. I know for me, I'm going to be testing it, you know, like starting from nothing. I'm going to be testing it. What, what does it look like after you've been using it for a few months? And I'm also going to be just dumping my, you know, <laughs> half a gigabyte, 10 years worth of notes in there and seeing mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. um, because the thing about this is, is what I'm really trying to build is a is a game loop, is a set of feedback mm -hmm. loops. The app itself looks really simple. 
Um, but what it's really doing is it's taking a lot of micro interactions that you have and it's, it's stitching them together into a creative process. So that mm -hmm. sort of from the bottom up, you're watching new ideas form and you're watching those ideas self-assemble into kind of um, uh, like robust notes from the bottom up. And, and to get that right, I think requires a lot of play testing and it requires living with it for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think if all goes well, by the end of the month, I'm hoping to have something that's robust enough to like live with. Um, and then I'll probably start handing it out to people to see mm -hmm. it, it won't be, you know, it won't be like a commercial release, but like a sort of alpha release. Amazing, amazing. Well, I'll be very curious to follow the development of this project. I, I know uh, it's a it's a ambitious thing to make a new new app in the space, and uh, it it's intri sufficiently intriguing that I would I would like to try it out. So, uh, yeah, I'm not helping myself by piling on some other kind of maybe ideologically motivated things that I would like to get right with this. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one way to build such a tool would be as a kind of software as a service subscription tool. I think a lot of things exist in that genre right now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Rome is one. Uh, I'm actually, I'm, what I'm trying to do now though is build this in a way that is, is sort of built on open protocols. So mm. um, the first version of this, the kind of MVP is gonna be kind of a single player app that does the kind of generative self-assembling ideas game loop that I tried to describe. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'd actually like to get to is a multiplayer experience where I can follow you, Tashin. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can follow me. And then that gets mixed in with the other kind of provocations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, but I feel like I get a lot of generative inspiration from things like Twitter. Mm -hmm. and, definitely, and definitely. They're not yeah, it's it's like Twitter's not actually designed well for this job. Yes. But like yes. It's the best like thing it works. right now. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I'm like, well, what would happen if you actually built something like this mm -hmm. from the ground up as a tool for thought? Um mm. as a multi incredible. incredible. And then uh, hopefully what what would it look like to build such a thing in mm -hmm. like a distributed peer-to-peer -peer way? So it's mm. not just a service, but it's like infrastructure for thought because I don't know, thinking is what people do. And, and coming from my like Mozilla kind mm -hmm. of <laughs> loving open systems, I would love for there to be some at least open infrastructure for thought. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's my kind of grand, you know, vision. Um, at a minimum, I think I should be able to build something that's like good to use as an individual. And then we'll see how far we can get down that path um, after I kind of like hit that initial goal. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of greenfield here. And, and I do think, um, you know, in some ways, like the web started uh, actually as like a tool for thought. And, mm -hmm. and Tim Berners-Lee actually kind of conceived of the web as something like a distributed Wikipedia. And, and it didn't really become that. But I, I think there's still space for something like that, like an internet of ideas. And um, I think it'd be really cool to get to that. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, well, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, let me throw you a curveball. One last hmm. question. Um, you know, I recall that when we met up a few years ago, we also talked about the environment a bit, and uh, it's actually starting to be a bit of a theme on this podcast of talking about hmm. the environment here and there. And, um, you know, I talked to a lot of people on this podcast and just in general in my life who are like, oh, I'm not an expert on that thing. And um, hmm. I think a lot of the problems that we're facing and the opportunities that we're facing as well are things that nobody's really an expert on. Like maybe somebody yeah. is an expert on an aspect of it, but because they're complex problems um, that you know have multiple facets and affect such a large scale of people and organizations and nations and of course the planet, uh, nobody's an expert, right? Nobody knows the answer. And so mm -hmm. I'd be really curious to ask you, like, what you know? I, hopefully, it's a it's a becoming apparent to whoever's watching this, like. Gordon knows a lot about a lot of different things and is seeing a lot of patterns. And I imagine that you are seeing some things around you know, the problems with the environment and what might be possible in, in that space in you know, the coming decades. And 
uh, I know you feel and care deeply about it as well. So what are you seeing and um, wh where do you see that going as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the way you frame that. So Horst Riddle was this um, uh, systems theorist who developed the idea of like a wicked problem, which is like a very multifaceted problem that has no one solution. And he said that there's like a symmetry of ignorance around wicked problems, that there's there are no experts because we're all mired in the same problem. And I think climate feels, it feels that way to me. Um, I also know uh, like you, you uh, spent a lot of time with uh, Oak, is that right? Mm -hmm. And I think Oak it seemed to me anchored a lot of their practice in 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 this kind of um, problem as well, and I like I really appreciate that. Um, so I I guess uh, what can I say? I tried to pull the ripcord and redirect my career toward climate stuff once. Um, it was a failed attempt. So I mentioned I could sort of did a side quest at MIT. Um, didn't quite pan out the way I'd hoped. Ended up crashing out and going back to doing web stuff. Uh, I think that you know there's a lot of important problems to be solving for climate. Uh, I think it's important that people like me, technologists, be devoting themselves to those problems. Um, narrow technical skill sets are valuable sometimes when tackling these issues. Uh, it's hard. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. I'll offer maybe a weird perspective. Um, maybe this is self-serving, but. Oh, that's what uh, I'm hoping for, this. <laughs> yes. um, I think the pandemic kind of surprised me. I was pretty disenchanted with my, with my career choice in, in tech um, in 2015, you know, 2016. I made some serious attempts to kind of redirect to a climate adjacent tech area. Um, but a really weird thing that happened during COVID was like watching a large chunk of sort of civilizational processes route around the virus through the internet, hmm. um, very imperfectly, right? Like there were a lot of essential workers that didn't get the benefit of being able to work from home. Um, but I try to think about what such a pandemic would have looked like in the eighties and it's staggering. Like it's terrifying to think of there. It just would have been like, it, it definitely would have been like the, the you know, 1% of people would have died kind of a thing. And maybe there would have been famines. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I can't say that we're not out of the frying pan yet. We're seeing like huge flare ups in, in Asia right now. And so like, it's, it's really scary, right? But um, I see us going into a, a very challenging time. Like I think climate is the issue of our generation and our children. Um, as well, and their children probably too. And we're, you know, we're going to basically have to go from a civilization that bootstrapped itself on oil and can still consumes oil. Um, you know, and, and even people like, uh, what is the, the um, Protestant work ethic guy? Sorry, this has a point, I promise. Um, no problem. Max Weber, Max Weber. So Max Weber and Marx were like the two historians who kind of like created this concept of the history of technology and sociology, very formative people. They both identified oil as like the driving force of capitalism, right? And, and of industrialization. So that, that includes communism because communism was an industrial sort of uh, uh, way of organizing society. Um, and we have to get off of off of that path and onto a path where civilization is is zero emissions. Like we only kind of fifty percent know how to do that right now. And and even if we knew how to do it fully, it's going to be like a huge, huge, agonizing change. Even if we do everything right. Um. Yeah. Even if we do everything right. So I mean. The estimates from scientists are like, this should be looking, what we should be doing right now, if we took this seriously, would be something on the scale of World War II era mobilization, mm -hmm. but with regard to fixing the climate, and, and we're not seeing that. So, you know, I, I think we're, <laughs> we're going to see a lot of migration, we're going to see a lot of broken systems, we're going to see, like, 
weather impacts like the you know the wildfires that are becoming very common here on the west coast and um in a weird way like in a way i can't predict i i i'm becoming convinced that the internet is an important piece of resiliency infrastructure for humanity um and and that is a little bit scary to me because i think it's also a system that is kind of broken right now mm -hmm. like power is very centralized um you know, we see versions of the internet, like in WeChat, that are used for very deep authoritarian control. Um, I just, I don't know. I, for me, it kind of like reinvigorated my desire to try to figure out a way to um, build infrastructure that is uh, that is a commons, that is resilient. It's a very, very small piece of the puzzle. I, I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but I, I, I guess I would say if you can tackle carbon emissions directly, that's probably what you should do. <laughs> but mm. but like in the particular weird corner that I exist, I happen to have a lot of expertise in this very narrow space. So that's what I'm going to go after for a few years and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I think it's, it's well seen and well served and um... Yeah, it's good to get your perspective on this issue because uh, it's good. It's good to attend closely to what's happening here and yeah. to be okay with not having answers and to be willing to uh, take the steps that we do know we can. So I appreciate that. If I could actually, I'm just looking at the books on my desk right now. Um, mm -hmm. This one, and I mm. this I gotta recommend this to you. Um, mm. Vaslav Smil, Grand Transitions. He's basically mm -hmm. like. This is a map of the contemporary world and how it works. Mm. And, and as such, it's also kind of a map for what needs to be reformed. Mm. Um, so he looks at like, what is it? Five, I think, big transitions, four grand transitions. So population, uh, like the population boom that happened mm. after vaccines and after the green revolution, um, agriculture, which was the green revolution, energy, which is like basically oil, Mm -hmm. and, um, and econ economics, which is like mm -hmm. the way we've scaled markets for better or worse. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this, this book is really amazing for overview effect. Like it just, uh, I'm only part of the way through right now, but I think mm -hmm. it's one of the best read by him. And he was the one who set me off on the climate journey in the first place. Like reading mm -hmm. his work transformed my world completely. So mm -hmm. I, I used to sort of be climate years ago as like, a sort of problem off to the side, like pollution, you know, pollution or like, oh no, there's a Pacific garbage patch, like that kind of scale problem. What I didn't mm -hmm. realize was like, this, this is, this is bigger than any other problem we faced as a species. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be the kind of the crucible challenge of our time. Mm, definitely, definitely. Um, g given the scope of everything we've talked about, you know, a lot of dimensions. Is there anything else that you want to mention or share uh, before we end the conversation? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I am. I tend to be a free range conversationalist. I hope that's all right. <laughs> no, um, it's perfect. I, it's perfect. Uh, not to plug, but if anyone's interested in this project that I'm working on, you can find it at um, subconscious.substack.com. And I'm just sort of unspooling my thinking around the problem and taking my time and doing it as I build. Um, so if anyone else is interested in this problem space or might want to be like a, a tester of this software at some point, um, yeah, feel free to join me in the journey. Excellent, excellent. I suspect people will join that. So I, I for one, will be curious to try it out, so. Um, I would love that. Yeah, it would be fantastic if you'd give it a go. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for talking to me today. I, I love this conversation and um, I hope you enjoyed it and I expect others will as well. So thanks for your time and for talking about so many different things and giving your perspective. I really appreciate it a lot. Thanks for having me, Tashin.